Hey everyone, uh, Matt Donner, Chief Academic Officer here at Pyramine to show you a couple of different ways to work with reverb, uh, something I like to call beyond the room. Uh, the idea with reverb is, of course, it's to emulate the sound of a room uh, that a person might not have been recorded in. I have a session here from one of our students, John Gillick, and it's a really, really sweet tune. Uh, it's got a very nicely performed lead vocal on it with a little backing vocal. We'll listen to the uh, first verse into the chorus. Let me just shrink this region down a little bit. And I'm going to show you a couple of different ways to think about reverb that aren't really traditional. The most important concept that we're going for here is actually something you may or may not even know exists, something called early reflections. So I'm going to pull up this, probably the simplest of all reverbs in logic, the A verb. And you'll notice that nowhere on here does it actually say early reflections. This particular tool doesn't even give you that. And, and just to give you an idea, first of all, the difference between early reflections and reverb. Um, think of it this way. When sound leaves a source, like a voice, it goes everywhere. It goes 360 degrees and just spreads outward like a, like a balloon expanding. And when it hits a surface like a desk or a floor or a wall or a piece of furniture, it immediately bounces off of that surface. Uh, reverb is what happens when it bounces 30, 40, 50, 200, 300 different times before it comes to your ears. But early reflections are what happens when the sound leaves, hits one or two surfaces, and then comes right back to your ears. And in fact, that's all you really hear. It's a really short, simple elongation of the sound. But unlike reverb, it doesn't trail on for half a second, two seconds, three seconds. It's super, super short. The advantage to doing this is you can give your listener the sense of um, depth and space without it taking up so much time that you lose intelligibility. In other words, you can still hear what the person is saying. Now notice we don't really have that control on this reverb, although this reverb actually sounds pretty good. Um, given the l incredible limitations of the parameters. Uh, I've got a fairly small to mid room size here. And there's this other concept I want to introduce you to, which is called pre-delay. Uh, for those of you that know, great. For those of you that don't know, what happens is the signal goes into the reverb and gets held back, in this case by 58 milliseconds, and then the reverb begins. Uh, this is a neat way to sort of create a delay effect without the crispness of an actual delay. Uh, what a delay does is it takes the exact signal that goes into it, waits, and then plays it back exactly as it was. What pre-delay in a reverb does is it, the signal comes into it, it waits, and then it gives you the sound back. But instead of giving you the, the original sound back, it gives you the reverbed sound back. So with pre-delay in a small room size, you can trick the listener into thinking that you've got a delay and a reverb when in fact both are going on at the same time. So here's my lead vocal, here's the backing vocal, Here's my, re, here's my uh, return. I'm using bus one. Bus one is sending you know, about neg seven. I'll bring it up to about neg six just to keep it nice, even math. And we'll listen without, with and without. One thing to keep in mind, when you're setting up reverbs, many people just plug them right on the inserts of the track. And yes, you can do that. Uh, it's not the preferred way to go in most cases. Uh, there are occasionally times you'll want to do that. Uh, when you put a reverb right on the insert, the way you balance how much reverb versus how much not reverb signal you get is through this mix channel. The problem is that it's impossible to create a scenario where you have all of the original signal and some of the reverb when all you can do is blend the mix because as you move this from 100% wet, meaning all reverb, to 100% dry, meaning all original signal, you always lose volume of the original signal. So the original vocal is just weaker. So you're always going to get a better, stronger vocal when you do a send and return. So you literally just create a send on a bus. And over here on this return, you see the input is bus one. So the signal comes through here, splits off to the negative six amount, comes over here, and then starts going through our reverbs. Now we got zero over here, and we've got a nice little blend over here. So if I want less reverb, I just turn the volume down. But I always leave the mix at 100%. So I've got 100% reverb over here, 100% dry signal over here. Uh, I don't lose any volume on my original vocal, and I've got as much reverb as I want or don't want. And again, I just lower the volume. So let's listen to the track a little bit without any reverb, just so you can hear what it sounds like dry. Sometimes I feel like I'm wailing. Give it a 
little more vocal here. Night come suspended in fog and dust. The world is moving in the circular bold eye. Can't escape. Sometimes I So that's the first verse in the chorus. I wanted to play you enough so you got a real vibe on the song. Uh, and you can hear the chorus comes in. We get these backing vocals as well. Now, I'm sending both the dry, or I should say the, the, the main vocal, lead vocal, and the backing vocals to the reverb uh, at the same level. And even though these are both at neg six, you can see there's a big difference between the faders here. I'm sending these pr uh, post fader, which means this level is dependent on this level. You just click and hold, you can choose post, pre, etc. cetera. Um, I'm gonna leave it post fader for now. And if I were to do pre fader, then this signal level wouldn't matter. It would just send full steam right off of the drive, right off of the disc. So anyway, that's the dry vocal uh, and the backing vocal. And you can see I've got a, a couple of settings here already. And just to give you an idea, again, the mix is 100% because I've got control over level here. I've got a fairly small room size. Uh, the reflectivity is 25%, so it's not going to be that um, that bouncy. And the density in time is also kind of small. The idea being this is meant to not really give you the sort of the big explosive reverb. It's meant to be super, super short. Um, really, it's not really reverby at all. It's more like a delay with a, a smear on it, if you will. And I'm using a rough amount of about 60 milliseconds. I'll knock that up to about 64 milliseconds. Uh, it's just a number that I kind of liked. Uh, as I was listening back, and I have it set across all these other reverbs as well. So I'll play it again, and halfway through, I'll unmute the tracks. So you can hear the vocal with and without this particular effect. And you, the net result is the vocal gets a little bigger, a little, takes up a little more space, has a little time bounce on it, but we can still hear the quality of every word. Sometimes I feel like I'm wailing. I'm suspended in fog and dust The world is moving in the circular bold I can't escape Sometimes I walk out at sunrise And I feel my skin So that's a neat little effect. Um, again, one of the things I like about it is with the delay, it makes it seem like it's in a big, like a, like an auditorium or something with just a single delay. But again, the delay is not crisp. It's not clear. It's real smeary uh, because of the fact that you have a small reverb or a small room. It's effectively tricking you into thinking that's something like early reflections. Again, you get the value of the intelligibility of the voice. You can hear the words that are being said. Uh, there's a little bit of a time delay on it, which gives it um, a nice sense of depth, uh, but it doesn't take up so much time that the thing is swimming in reverb. And if you feel like this is a little late, you can always knock it a little bit earlier or later as you choose. So you can really do this effect super easy with just the A-verb. Uh, let's move on to something a slightly more complex because as we'll find, uh, with the variety of different reverbs that Logic gives you, you get more and more control over things. Now this is the EN verb. Um, what I like about it is it gives you the EN or the envelope. It gives you an attack, decay, sustain, hold and release. Um, you've still got parameters like density and spread, but now you've got a filter here as well. Now with these settings, you can see with this longer 
uh, with a slightly up ramp attack. I don't know that it's long per se. Visually, it's long here, but it's not actually long here. This can kind of trick you into thinking you have a slightly reversed effect. Uh, so again, let's give it to you without and then with, and uh, we'll play it, play it down. Sometimes I feel like I'm weightless Like I'm suspended in fall dust The world is moving in circular bold I can't escape Okay, I'm going to stop it there um, just because I think you've got a pretty good sense of what's going on here, but I do want to make some adjustments. Um, the first adjustment is that it, unlike the uh, A verb, you can hear there's, there's just more reverb happening in this. Now, I could turn it down here, which is fine, but I actually like the volume. I just think there's too much reverb compared to the volume of the uh, dry signal. So the way that you control it is you come over to your send and actually lower the send. So you're actually giving, more, uh, giving less signal to the reverb itself. Lower it more. Like in fall dust. The world is moving in bold. I so you can see, for me, that's a that's a much more natural balance of uh, dry to wet signal, and I don't have to mess with the fader. I can just lower it here, and then it's all good. Um, you, again, you have lots of parameters here to play with, and I encourage you to um, see what you can build uh, by adjusting this envelope here. But I also want to show you that the pre-delay was off. So if I put that back on at about 60 milliseconds where we were before, uh, you'll get that slight delay between the dry signal and when this EN verb actually even kicks in. Uh, the other thing I'll play with is this density, and I'll play this while it plays. Um, I found this to be a very difficult parameter to adjust well. Um, and strangely enough, when the density is really low, it's um, kind of a tin can effect. I wasn't a big fan, but um, I'll play it now so you can hear the pre-delay at 60. And then as it plays, I'll mess with the density and you can decide for yourself if you dig it or not. Sometimes I feel like I'm wailing. I can You could hear when I crank down the density, it just gives this really strange, uh, highly resonant, digitally resonant kind of robotic sound. There might be a real purpose where you could use this creatively and perhaps sound design if you're trying to make kind of a metallic uh, or a robotic kind of sound. But in this particular track with this vocal, I, I don't think it really fits. So I'm actually going to make that even less uh, pingy. Um, one more listen. Sometimes I feel like I'm weightless Like I'm suspended in fall dust The world is moving in circular bold I can't escape Sometimes I So at the end there, I was giving you a little A-B comparison between the A-verb and then the N-verb, so you can really hear the differences. And you can hear the N-verb is just a much more pronounced effect, and the A-verb is much more subtle. But let's continue doing some comparisons.
when I first came to Pyramind, I, I had searched the forums and I had searched online, I had read magazines, I had talked with people, but it wasn't enough. What I needed to do was I needed to watch someone mix, start from scratch and make their way up to a professional project. I take them through all the steps and break it down piece by piece. I want them to understand how sound interacts in the environment, number one. Number two, I want them to understand how instruments behave in a room, how to capture those instruments. Here's a microphone. What does a microphone go to? Here it is in a real world environment. Now let's go back to the classroom and dissect that. After a certain amount of time within the core program, you have access to the studios, right? And you have access to the microphones. And you have access to just bring in whoever you want and record. The first two Tumbleweed Wanderers EPs, they were both uh, completely tracked here. I brought my band in. We set up drums, you know, did overdubs. Uh, had other Pyramind students on board as engineers, and uh, we had a really, really good time tracking those songs. There's a lot of hands-on experience. You get to see bands get recorded, you get to be involved with setting up the mics, the miking techniques, you know, the compressors, how everything in a studio flows. It's good to have that, that knowledge and the hands-on experience with the professionals that have, that have done that kind of work. There's no shortage to what you can do. It's a supportive environment that says, here is a space where you can be creative and mess up, and not only will we not judge you for messing up, we'll applaud you in those efforts. Mm -hmm.